All right. Hey, that's gone all right, isn't it? You use this stuff all the time for classes and then you, yeah, grill. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Let me shrink that. I was trying to do it on location in the amphib room at work. Um, so you could listen to the uh, phantasmal dart frogs chirping away in the background, but I was sat on a pair of step ladders like this. I was like, oh, it's not really going to be professional, but also I wanted to kind of just, I'm hoping to kind of make it interactive with any students out there or any staff from zoos or any external guests. Um, Cause I just want to kind of promote the importance of students really, but also the importance of the networks that we have within the zoo community, whether it be in um, a traditional red brick university or whether it be in a land-based college like us that we do higher education studies. Um, but also just to try and show, give students the confidence as well to, to feel like this isn't something out of your league, because I know from a lot of the research committee stuff we do with the research conferences, being online, it kind of, can make it easier sometimes to meet people but it can also make it it just puts up another barrier as well so please do ask questions if I can see the chat somewhere um, and then I can hopefully answer but I'm just going to talk through some ideas that I have about how important it is to kind of do these kind of networks but also what zoos can offer students for what universities and, and colleges can offer zoos as well in terms of the, the cross collaboration as well so this picture down here is a lovely picture of our research committee and I think apart from the Christmas meeting, that was the last time we all met in person. Um, and it's just a nice picture because I just think if we knew then how our jobs and how, how our roles would change across uh, the next two years would be, you know, we, we'd be smiling at Land Dudnall there on, on the beach at our last conference, our last in-person conference. But I think also as well, these opportunities to be had from these kind of relationships. And every time you go to a new conference or a new workshop or you join like this you get to meet another person and just that one person like Ben I recognized you straight away from the research uh, quiz uh, from our I think you won did you win second prize first prize first prize at our quiz and you just you know it's a face it's a familiar person and I think that's something that um, we can offer in the research committee so I work as a lecturer at Myerscore College, um, um, we're based up in Preston and when I first started the research committee in 2009, every time we were going to conferences people were like, where? Where are you from? And when we go to international conferences and you say you're from Myerscore, they go, oh, you're like, no, you've never heard of us. So I always say, oh yeah, we're just a small college up north. And then you think, we're not just a small college up north, we have a huge impact in our local kind of institution if you were like I've just been measuring dart frog tadpoles um in our amphib room down there with with a student and just you know the opportunities and the potential we've got and I also think it's important that as staff we appreciate what we can offer as well as what students can get from it as well and I also think everybody's is, is the same value whether you're a college a university a small collection a medium collection a large collection uh, a zoo an aquarium and when I say zoo I'm referring to aquariums here as well. Uh, museums, um, we went to Manchester Museum the other week to pick up some frogs and what a phenomenal, uh, you know, phenomenal collection of amphibians there as well and in terms of the benefit and the opportunities it's, it's, there's ample across and I just really want to promote that today in terms of what, you know, students can bring to the table. So first question is, <laughs> cue the Halloween crowing bird out there, right. So Ultimately, what, what this is all about is graduation, and it's about that end certificate and that end qualification, but what it takes to get you there. And I think for students in the room, it's really important to treasure, respect, admire, but also utilise those links that your university tutors, anyone you've worked with on the animal units, anyone you've worked with in your local collections, uh, industry experts, people you meet along the way, it's really important to share that. But keep in mind what when you throw your cap up in the air, how many times you get to do it, what opportunities you've had along the way. And I think that's something when you get really stressed out about your workload and your project and where do I start and what am I going to do, it's to have that end goal in mind of what you are going to achieve by the end of your qualification outside of your actual dissertation project as well. You know, meeting people in the zoo industry, um, speaking to some world experts who work with mountain chicken frog at London Zoo, for example, or uh, Paul and his flamingos. And, and it's just a privilege, but also your course will bring a lot of those privileges along the way as well. In terms of your expectations, 
Um, I think when you start in a project, which I know people in the audience have already finished the project, but might be looking at next projects. I think any project, regardless of your level, it's about what, what is actually out there. Um, speaking from experience, I've been doing this job 11 years now and supervise ample students every year from all sorts of different interests and industry types and project types as well is to come with an idea but how do you get that idea and I think that's the hardest thing sometimes is working out what on earth where on earth do you start now I've just got such an inquisitive mind and I can't look at that bottle of safe fall behind me on the table without thinking of a project to do you know we, we watched a talk um at the mammal working group on the um the buildings at Dudley the listed well, it's a Tyvek, but they're not because they're PPE. Um, oh, geez, I knew I should remember that. And straight away, we've been watching that. I'd come up with a huge project on looking at the importance of these listed buildings and what they bring to conservation. And I haven't done anything on it since, but it was a nice idea at the time. But I think the first step is just for something to inspire you, something to interest you. Read the literature, see what's out there. What species need studying? What species are, can you not find a lot of literature on? Where... Is the tax are going? What tax it interests you? Um, I mean, I wrote a, a project list and sent it out to our next lot of third years and just said, these are some ideas we've got. Anybody interested? And Layla, who's doing the frog study straight away, was like, oh my God, I love frogs. Can I help with that? And it's ha having that affinity with the species or the taxa, but also challenging yourself and doing something that you wouldn't normally explore. What areas get highlighted in Jazar or in zoo biology or in Rattel if I've got members, the shape of enrichment, on the websites which promote what areas of research should be carried out. What studies have been studied to death? So what species? And I'm guilty of this because I started my work on carnivores, large carnivores, tigers and leopards, um, looking at stress response when they move between collections. Um, loads has been done on tigers, loads have been done across carnivores, but I mean, it doesn't mean they can't be done, but could that study methodology be applied to smaller cats, for example, which might not have had the same um, kind of research on it? I think it's really important for when you're contacting collections, whether it but just to not just be another email coming through. I mean, I get 30, 40 a day and I'm on leave. You can imagine when the students are back, how that steps up. And I think sometimes you're just like, oh, geez, another one. <laughs> but it sounds really rude. But when you're out at the zoo and you've been out in the rain all day and you've been putting this smile on and, and you've got a headache and you're hungry or whatever, and you get back to your office and there's 150 of these emails, you're just going to go through and, and siphon and pick the most professional ones or the most interesting. And I think it's really important to remember that as part of the Zoo Licensing Act and the roles of the modern zoo, we, zoos do have to carry out research, but there's plenty of research going on in all different levels, whether it's keeper, whether it's um, records based, whether it's in-house, whether it's students, whether it's staff. So I think it's about making yourself interesting to the zoo, making your project idea interested. I can't tell you how many times when I used to work at the zoo, we'd get an email through. I really want to do research. We take me on. You're like, hmm. Mm. <laughs> nobody's emailed for a month so yeah oh, oh no I've had a hundred of those today so no and it can be that cutthroat sometimes because the point a lot of the research teams at the zoo already have what interests they need what expectations of their collection plan over the next so many years what study ideas need exploring you've also got the industry links with the acad academia so the different universities that the zoos might work with already so you've got to make yourself interesting is this research of importance? If you contact them and say you want to do something on um, palm oil, which is the bottom picture down there, which I took all my pictures off the Biaza Research Facebook page, so hopefully that's all right. Um, and somebody contacts you and say, we want to do something on sustainable palm oil, the collection might go, wow, that's fantastic. Or might go, well, that's not really our remit for this year. We're focusing on um, Asian songbird crisis or something. So it's about thinking about what is the zoo doing at that time? What kind of opportunities do they offer? Most important fundamental thing is how much effort, time, commitment, work um, is needed from the collection. I remember a study on red panda forage and it was a really good study in principle, but it needed this forage on this day, this browse on this day, this, that. and the practicalities of a study like that is really hard to do in amongst a busy working environment. It would be great on paper, but practicality, can you get the available browse source? Can you get it in the right quantity size? How available is it going to be? Is it going to be there when you're there as a student? Health and safety concerns, like how, how dangerous 
in terms of additional risk is this for the collection if you're coming in as a research visitor where you have a vest you sign in at reception you you're, everything's as if you're a visitor is a little bit different to if you're actively working with the animals or if you're involved in purchasing products for them for enrichment or something the accessibility and that applies across the board if you're wanting to do something out of hours then it's very unlikely you're going to get permission unless you've got equipment and an IT to allow you to explore those avenues like camera traps, CCTV, that kind of stuff. Um, we have a huge, huge uh, kind of promotion in, across the research team presently about studying animals outside of hours because we only watch them for a small scale of the day. And one real real important area we're really trying to increase is what do animals do when people go home brilliant opportunities some really interesting stuff but without equipment that's already in place it's going to be very hard for zoos to carry that out um thinking about how many hours how many days what seasons do the zoos close for the winter are they open on so many days that kind of stuff uh what will the zoo get out of it so ultimately what will be the research output now we all long to have publications done um, sometimes zoos don't ever hear back from the student once they've collected the data um, and even though it's part of the contractual agreement when you sign up a research committee once they've left the institution and their academic email no longer works it's very hard sometimes for the zoos to get hold of those studies and that's something that as a, a member of academic staff we take very seriously is to make sure that the zoos get that that work but is it something that they can then take to conferences and present because ultimately it's their data mm -hmm. If it's something that you're aiming for a high impact peer reviewed publication on it, on enrichment, for example, they're going to say, well, what can you bring different to enrichment? What's already been studied to be able to, to get that. If you say, well, I want to present at the research conference next year and I want to take it to Abwerk and I want to take it to this Jazar, I want to put it in Rattel, whatever. It's a little bit more as in benefit for the zoo, so to speak, and the zoo community just snapshotted a lot of awesome pictures off the research committee Facebook page again of thinking about what it is your studies looking at is it understudied taxa how about the tree kangaroo the goodfellas tree kangaroo which I'm guessing it looks like it's a chester photo I'm not too sure Bactrian camel monitor lizard enrichment a tree frog uh, people what about people you know, there's lots of uh, real important study areas on human well-being, health and well-being, specifically with green space and blue space for aquariums following um, COVID. But if you're going to want to watch people, then you need to make sure you come in with the right armory, if you will, so to speak. Like, what what did you do about human ethics? What did you do about covert operations? You know, it's not it's not a pair of glasses and a fake tash anymore and a big trench coat and you sit behind your newspaper you know watching people there's ethics for this kind of stuff and it all needs to be completed but it can be some real good potential and, and great opportunities for collections training um looking at social grouping i think this is a cichlid sorry fish people out there um looking at sentience of fish looking at enrichment and close use resource utilization uh, penguins down the bottom was looking at um, chick rearing and imprinting with uh, foster parents so to speak are uh, amazing octopus anyone who does studies on octopus is uh, great for us in fact we used to have what poster just up over here of octopus enrichment um, hoof work training for hoof work all of these amazing topics might be something that could be going on and they need someone to collect data on or they might have data and they need someone to do the analysis on. So that's another idea as well. But it's thinking about something a bit different, a bit out there that can really strive interest with the collection. Um, I want to point people to the research Facebook, oh, start again, the research page on the Biaza um, main website. There's masses of opportunities for students, whatever stage you're at, whether you're starting, whether you're um, halfway through your course, whether you're with a project already, whether you're going on to postgraduate study, whether you're finished, whether you're not a student and you just want to know what's happening in the zoo community. Um, the research page, this is open access and there's a breadth of amazing resources on here. So we have um, screenshotted and I say it's not my computer, so I was like, how do I blow this up? <laughs> Technology. Um, if you go under the research resources tab, you'll find there's a research priorities area. There is masses of information on there about projects that um, need carrying out. And uh, I actually was buzzing the other week because I decided to come up with some amphibian projects that we could do at work here. 
um, and I devised a couple of projects and I thought they were really class. And then I spoke to Chris, who's, who's one of our uh, Amphib guys, and he was like, oh, I assume you've looked on the priorities. I was like, oops, <laughs> I totally forgot, even though I, I helped with this. Anyway, I looked on the priorities and two project ideas what I'd already come up with all on my own at big school were actually on the research priority list. So I was buzzing. I was like, yes, this is brilliant. So some of them are really simple. If I've come up with it, it's going to be really simple. In terms of just looking at um, enclosure use, resource utilisation of understudied taxa. So amphibs, avians, reptiles, fish, inverts, some brilliant stuff there. Um, and it each there's a separate tab on the spreadsheet for each uh, ta taxonomic working group, research committee, um, liaison member, if you will, so birds, reptiles, amphibs, um, and so on and so on. So you can have a look there and find, see what projects are out there. But then also um, over to the right, we've got the research handbook, and I appreciate it's very small, but there's a link to download the research handbook, which has been written by the committee. And no matter what stage of your project you're at, there'll be something in there of use. It's chapters based on how to start, who do you talk to, how do you contact people, what projects you come up with, what stats do you do, what methods do you apply, health and safety, ethics, it's all sorts, stats, all sorts in there. So that's a really good resource as well that we just want to encourage people to, to access and use. So... I think also it's important to think about why you, why would the zoo be interested specifically in you? Uh, what is it about your experience, your personality, your manner, your academic route, for example, why zoos would want to work with you? I'm just thinking of projects from when I used to work at the zoo or what's come in over the last few years at our local collection, um, marketing, health and safety, sustainability, stuff to do with the business, gift shop management. We had a huge photography exhibition once of photography students and the research project was looking at how the visitors engage with the photography and the art that was displayed. So sometimes it could be a real way out subject that the zoos are not used to kind of working with. It might be a bit much, but I just thought I'd put it in there anyway, because if it came to me as a student application, I'd be like, oh, look at the effort. You know, if you've got your CV written on, you've got a nice letter, why not stick it in the post? Email is so easy. It's so easy to miss. It's so easy to send, so both ways. Whereas if you stick it in the post and address it to a research, uh, research person or research representative, conservation education department, curator, I'm not quite sure, every zoo would differ. But if you sent it in and said you're really interested in this project, the likelihood of it making it to someone's table is probably going to be more than one of 100 emails a day, if that makes sense. Some zoos have big research teams whose main job is research. Some zoos have where the research staff are part time, fitting it in and amongst the normal talks, present, presenting in the zoo, classroom sessions, outreaches, cleaning animals. Some are keepers who do it within their own time. Some are keepers who do it within work time. Some don't have big research teams where it's just somebody who's interested in research who might then respond. So it depends on who your contact is as well. And often with email, if you email the general inquiries, it just goes to the person, whoever they think is most suitable. So it might not necessarily get to the right person, but sometimes a letter in physical is, is a really nice way of doing it. Offer the zoo an opportunity that they don't want to miss out on. Obviously don't go, I really love animals and I've watched David Attenborough all life and I'm going to be brilliant because then they'll be like, oh. <laughs> there's that aside to it as well. But it's about giving the zoo the opportunity to feel like they can gain something from having you there. If they've got 50 projects ongoing already, why would they need to take an extra one? Because that extra one might be a lot of extra work. It might be really worthwhile and really worthy, um, but it also might be something they, can't, they don't really need to invest in at that time. I always think to treat it like a job application that every time I do a research application I always treat it as if it's the first time I've ever done it and check my grammar, my punctuation, my spelling, my presentation. Um, you know if the cat's come in and sat on it and put paw prints all over it you know, I wouldn't send that one off. <laughs> you know it's, it's about making because that might be the only time you, you can actually get your foot in the door at that time. Some people do assume when they've got supervisors who've got good links with the zoo community um, that they'll be all right, they'll get me in. Well, not necessarily, but also we might only have a certain few projects that we can supervise that year and we might want to get the best of the best, so to speak, in terms of the best opportunities, the best outputs or the best for the zoo. 
Um, but also as well, you might have supervisors who might have lots and lots of experience, but potentially want a certain type of topic doing as well. So and it's important to not just assume your supervisor is going to get you that opportunity because a big part of it is having, um, having the independence, the commitment, uh, the care, the passion, the confidence to actually drive it forward in an official application. Show commitment. I know that's obvious to you guys. Like, I'm preaching the preach here. Pre what do they say? Preaching the, yeah. Um, because you, you've come to this, which is brilliant. But I think when there might be 50 students coming through just from one university, and the zoos might work with five or six universities as it stands anyway, they want to be able to pick the best projects and the best ideas. We have lots of students who say, what projects can I do? And it's great, but sometimes you're like, oh, come up with something. But then if they come up with something and it's not relevant for that time, then they've wasted the time, but it does show independence. Maybe what ideas have you got? We do research priority lists. Obviously, there's the Biaza ones, but also collections do their own as well. And I often email our local collections or speak to them and say, have you got you know any ideas of any projects? And ideas fly in and we just make notes. And then you think, oh, I've, I've got the perfect student for that. Oh, or then the next year, oh, a student who I think could be really good at that project. So it's about kind of just seeing what, what's available in your local area. Plan a schedule, you know, how is this actually feasibly going to work? I always get students to open up a diary and I always photocopy them in F3 and go, right, okay, there's your schedule. This is now. This is when it has to be handed in, if it's a dissertation, a project, an MSc. This is when you need to finish your data collection. Oh, that's when you need to finish your analysis. This is when you need to finish your data collection. Okay, so we've now got a 10-week window. Right, let's put Christmas, Christmas and New Year. Not saying you should have it off, but you know, potentially the zoo might not want extra students in there at that time if they're not open, for example. Okay, so we've now got 10 weeks. I've got classes three days a week. I work at here on that day a week. So really I've only got two days a week that I can commit. Okay, so I want to do, just thinking of, we had a parrot study once and the student came and wanted to do 15 enrichment types with five African greys. Five times she wanted to do each enrichment type. I was like, good luck with that. So when we planned it out I was like you can do three enrichment types properly not we're just chucking it in all the time we've got repeated measures but we can also do it and then you've got a day off you've got work you've got those your classes that's when your other assignments are in that's when the zoo have got big events and therefore th that might affect the animals or that's when the animals are breeding so that might change the behavior which might be what you need to do all of these things and just planning out that initial schedule will really really help in just showing that you've thought about the detail of your method. I think if you're going to plan and you're going to show the zoo that you're planning this and the zoo have agreed and you're in the zoo and you're doing your project, is to stick to it. There's nothing worse when you're a member of staff at a zoo and you've arranged for so-and-so to meet the student at the enclosure at this time just because they want some extra information or the enrichment needs to go in at one o'clock because in amongst they're looking at pre-feeding behaviour, anticipatory behaviour, or they're looking at, they need it for an hour after they've been fed, they need to observe, and then the student isn't there, or the student phones in sick, or it's raining, I'm not coming today, because the zoo's still functioning. Um, and I think when you've got a lot of resources being used, it might not seem a lot as a student, but it certainly is in amongst the busy zoo day. But it's also a reflection of you, people do get poorly sometimes, you know, things do come up. But if you've got a contact at the zoo, you give them sufficient notice, or, don't overestimate what you can offer. That's my biggest problem. I, oh, yeah, of course, I'll turn that around in a month. Month's gone. And it's about being realistic. Um, just yesterday, we're planning a sloth study, um, a UK sloth study, which is going to be Yaza. And originally, I would have been like, oh, well, we'll find the money to pay for shipping the samples. Yesterday, I was sensible and I said, how are we going to pay for this? I was like, oh, I sound like an adult. Because in the old days, I'd have been like, yeah, just do it. We'll work it out. I mean, I still want to just say that and do that. But practically, if we can't fund to ship the samples and the keepers have collected them, it's not going to be great and it won't look professional and it won't be useful. But it's about having that realistic expectations, but also making sure you push what you can and can't do. Keep, keep your zoo contact in the loop all the time. Um, the hours I spent sat in the car park at the zoo when I was um, doing my original undergraduate project on elephants in Richmond because the keepers had to do this, so I had to go there and we were building it and then they, they couldn't build it for another two weeks because this was happening. So I had to then take another two weeks out. And even though inside I was crying, outside I was like, no problem, thank you. 
see you there. Take care. Bye. Have a nice day. Ah, what am I going to do? You know, but it's, it's that whole, you've got to fit into that circuit. And I think that's the biggest advice I really want to encourage today. Also, the fun side of it, meeting people. Cue, psycho, <laughs> psycho Halloween bird. What is that? I think it's our minor bird. Get out to conferences, meet people. These, these people will become your future colleagues and your peers. These are people who you will work with on projects. You just speak to people at conferences. It's quite nerve wracking at first, but when you know just one person, or you can arrange to meet that person by the uh, croissants in the morning, for example, and then you just feel like you've got a bit more, you know, you, you, you fit in a bit better in, so to speak. So it is quite nerve wracking when you go to a conference, when you know, even is when you've been doing it a long time. And here's just some fun pictures from along the way, which is just, you know, with students. And this on the left is Brandon, who is a senior keeper at London Zoo. He was one of our old Myosco students, 2013, I think he left. He's worked at a few different collections. Every time we go to conferences, we go together or we meet there. And then there's a few extra staff that I've never met. And then they become friends and then they become colleagues and then they become project ideas. And you get so much from out from meeting people. The icebreakers are great at conferences where they're designed for people who've not been to conferences before to come and meet. And we did one at Living Coasts at the painting conference a few years ago, which was penguins and pims, which was brilliant. But I was driving the minibus, so I just saw the penguins. Hence why I've got a cup of tea on the picture on the right. But it was just nice because you just kind of, as as confident staff, we pick up students along the way who might be on their own and come and sit with us, come and have some food with us. And, you know, what project's yours? And, and just kind of creating a bit of you know a nice friendly environment because that is one thing we definitely definitely have in the, the zoo world conference attendance has changed a lot and i think it is a little easier now for people to exploit this um with lots of resources at three conferences or um just being out there and speaking to people and and chat function is great for just having conversation with people as well um especially people who are nervous and not very confident out in public spaces but I love nothing more than the picture up the top left, which was as a uh, South Devon College, was it? Where we had the research conference after, and this was the day after the Cayley the night before and the cream tea. So there was a lot of, and there was lots of red wine flying around the place. So there were lots of rough heads this day as well. But just sitting next to people and chatting to them and seeing what's going out there. Uh, picture in the middle is from the research conference um, this last year, last year. Yeah, last year, it's all rolling into one, um, where we just did a few talks as um, a virtual event, the first virtual event we've ever done. And these are all still available on the Facebook page, so you could still engage with a lot of the talks now and you could watch the videos on the Biaza Research Committee Facebook page. Um, and you can engage with speakers, and, you know, they, if you tag them in it, they might still reply if they're, if they're active on there. Um, pack specific one is one we did in October for the mammal working group um, and that was your um, weird species is how we call it so pangolins, aardvarks, anaphoras, or sloths, tamandua, armadillo amazing and it is absolutely outstanding we had something like 175 delegates from all around the world attend who all were keepers of pack species and from that there's been another two studies ideas come about where we can work with people who have saw experience in this field. Down the bottom left, there's the research conference from this year, which I think a few of you went to. Um, and this is the speed talks and the poster sessions are still on the Facebook page. So you can engage with those as well. But it just kind of ideas can just come about from talking to people just by looking at the posters at the conference. Um, and then, but not forgetting when you're at home watching a conference, like the picture on the right, you're still at home so it's quite, it can feel quite strange but I think this hybrid way of conferencing now can open up so much more opportunity for people who necessarily can't get to the conference because of funding because of work because of distance um many issues you know many reasons why but also I think each one of those has got a huge opportunity to share and I think as a student to get yourself in known in the industry is to be at these conferences and to speak to people and share your work out there as well definitely it's so helpful get your ideas out there network 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 um i tried to put some fun pictures together here um and it's not just zoo specific conferences this is some students we took down to reading actually for um well i have been to reading 
Oh yeah, um, I had a great time, I've forgotten about it. This was a U4 Student Scholars, um, and U4 Universities Federation of Animal Welfare, if you've not heard of it, is um, a an international uh, kind of a association aiming to show student research to a global community. And we drove down to Reading, got stuck in the snow, it was brilliant. So some Christmas songs, I had a great day. But we met people, we met similar faces and it gave the students confidence to be at a conference like, like Donald Broom sat next to me. I was like, well, I to speak to him. I didn't, why? You speak to him, you know, you know, he'd be genuinely interested in your topics and your subjects. Uh, the next picture is Meg, one of our students who's uh, working at the zoo as a primate keeper, seasonal primate keeper. This was her handing a work in. In an online world, the same opportunities weren't there. But this year she came and presented her work as a poster at the conference and we're driving it forward as well. So even if you're in that aim where you've not been able to go to conferences, it's not ended. There's still plenty more you could do. Then we've got Sally here at U4. This was the international uh, conference um, at Newcastle and she'd just been to a friend's wedding the day before so we met her in the car park a little west for wear but she didn't say no because she knew what an opportunity this conference would have been for her. I took this this project in a different different data set to you for at Bruges the year after and I ended up meeting a lady who was working in a, a behaviour lab in one says Sweden, who was working with African grey parrots, specifically looking at cognition. And we were in contact a few times after this, and she was interested in, in the vocalisation stuff that we'd found with this study. So you just don't know who you're going to speak to. The fun stuff up here, behind my name, this was the Kaylee, which was hilarious, at um, Painting Zoo at one of the conferences. We've done um, all sorts of weird and wonderful things at conference events and this is where it always breaks down the kind of you know the scariness of people and just having a i mean a Kelly is, is something a bit different and it was real fun um but just meeting other people and just getting to know people don't forget what conferences and, and events symposium workshops that your institution can offer this was our one of our conferences that we do every year um and this was one of our students Gemma, who did an aardvark study I, she took hers as a poster to Edinburgh conference and then we invited her back next year to speak to the students and she was like well I'm not standing up in that lecture theatre I was like you are and she was like no no I'm not and you know she did and she did a brilliant job because I knew she could and I would have never pushed her to do that if I'd known you know she wasn't capable and it was great because she can now put on a CV that she's presented at a conference um, and this was the, the group down here under questioning they look like they're in a line of fire don't they they had a good time, I'm sure they did. But always think about what else, what other opportunities can bring. It doesn't always have to be your ideas. So these pictures here from the left are a student trip to a conservation talk from um, Sumatra and Orangutan Society at Chester Zoo. And we we took them, we all did a donation to attend, but they were listening to conservation field experts. Um, and just giving them the confidence to think about what they could possibly do in terms of career, but also research ideas as well. See what's out in Jazar. See what's out in um, the Rattel write-ups from the research committee. There's lots of work going on out there that might spark a bit of interest and enthusiasm. Don't forget about Jazar. So this is a journal. I can't, I can never say it without doing my jazz hands. I need to sit on my hands. So Jazar um, is an IASA journal, which is a brilliant resource. It's open access, it's free, you just get it online. And there's some great, great um, projects in there. And this one, The Deserter's Wolf Spider, is a talk that I think was presented at Painton, if I'm right, about three or four years ago, and that's been published in there. And there's some great evidence-based case studies as well. And that's a good starting point for um, peer-reviewed publication of, of your work as well so that's somewhere to to look and get interested in how to get your work published in there but opportunities come from opportunities so you just don't know what's going to happen um, you just don't know where this is going to take you or who you're going to meet at these conferences and these events but it's a brave thing to present your work at a, a conference like this but you know it's such an amazing feeling and you will be made to feel welcome but also you're representing your academic institution but also your collection and yourself and zoos love when students can go and present the work from all these different conferences so you know, target your working groups so if this was an LE study is there an LE meeting anywhere is there a mammal working group meeting it can go to the research conference it can go into Rattel there's lots of different places where 
you could take your work. And this is just a picture of um, the 20th anniversary, which was at Paynton, um, and they got everybody together. I, I'm hiding somewhere. I tend to hide around here or somewhere, I think. I tend to hide for these pictures. But just look how many possible people you could meet and see, and nice, friendly, smiley people um, all the way. But I just think it's a great community, and please don't be afraid to put yourself out there. But remember as well, it's a professional meeting, but also it's not an expectation that the zoo will take you on to do their work. And I'm sure, as I say, I'm not preaching the preach. I'm sure you, you don't think like that. But it's good to be positive and confident I'm, I'm proud of your efforts as well. So that's me waffled for far too long. But finished with a Komodo dragon. So do we have any questions? See, there's three in the chat. There are. I was going to say, yeah. Um, we've got a couple of great comments. So Paul said, uh, you make such good points, Mrs. B. Uh, Thank you. In questions that can be simply Googled uh, equals the best way of not getting a response. Do your homework about the people, place and or project before you get in touch. It makes you stand out and look more professional. The three Ps, people, place, project. Research the three Ps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Danielle said I think sometimes being a little ballsy and speaking to the people who write uh, all the papers you can read can open lots of doors I took my horsey work to a full sport conference and got so much knowledge and made lots of contacts in the sport world which has come in handy later on ballsy typical <laughs> she's one of my colleagues so <laughs> I was going to reply with something that I remembered no professional head <laughs> yeah, uh, and then Ben put something saying, um, "Are there any resources for by, from Biaza guiding students through the research publication process with advice on appropriate papers to target?" Yes, Ben, brilliant. The research handbook. There's a great section in the research handbook, um, and I've just managed to write a publication finally after all this time and get it through peer reviewed process. Whee! And it's currently at the proofing stage. And I use that. Um, it's on dogs, weirdly. But um, I use that book as well to just give me the confidence to read and to, to look at the different levels and stages of doing it. And also don't forget the guidelines of the publication you go into. Because the same paper of mine went to three separate journals, advised by that one to that one. And even though it was the same company, their expectations were totally different shall we say in many ways yeah so read the guidelines first and, and just read read a few papers from that publication and see what kind of stats they do and how they present it and how they word it and how they write it and how it flows and that gives you a lot of scope for then how to start yours as well yeah okay. brilliant well anyone else Are we done no, I think we're I done. Say that. Are we done? I want to go for dinner. <laughs> can I run away? <laughs> no, that's absolutely brilliant. No, thank you ever so much, Lou. I think we can all agree that was really informative and useful. Uh, so really appreciate your time as always, Lou. Um, Lou's talk has been so uh, we'll look to get that on probably in the next week or two. Um, so thank you everyone, everyone for coming. Uh, if you want to come to any of our other Biaza Brings You talks, uh, there's still some left to go before the end of the summer. Uh, our next one is by three staff from Chester Zoo, um, which is taking place uh, near the start of September. So all the information is on the Biaza website if right. you are interested. Uh, but other than that, just to say thanks again, Lou, and thank you everyone else for coming as well. No worries. Can I just say before we finish, I've just spotted the end bit of uh, Ben's about it. Sometimes students' uh, perspective that it's a zookeepers only club. Um, please don't ever feel like that because you're as important as everyone else there. And just um, knowing one person, like you've met us a couple of times now, just at a conference, come over and say hi. And we'll remember you. We do. We definitely. And we were like, oh, you're the. Oh, God, I'm trying to remember your study now. <laughs> oh, anyway, nice to see you. <laughs> we don't bite. It's definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, absolutely. Absolutely. Reach out. So. Thank you. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Nice Liz. to see everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>